I'm Jeff. This is Abba. Say hi, Jeff and Abba. Hi, Jeff and Abba. And in the next 75 minutes, we're going to show you as many tips in Premiere Pro as we can, and hopefully our goal is to make you cry. That's our goal. Uh, there's our email. We're going to put up. A, we're going to give away all the materials here. Uh, as far as the deck and notes are concerned, do not panic. If you don't get a screenshot, at the very end, there'll be a sign up for some extra stuff. This is the class you're in. There's always a smarter way to work. This is the right class. This is your chance to run out of the room screaming. Nobody ran out of the room. Good sign. We'll give you the deck and more. That's Abba on the left. I'm Jeff. We're both master instructors. We help develop a program. We help write the materials that help people educate with Premiere Pro. My remote just wasn't true. Oh, there we go. You need to be yeah, patient. Patient. Like every editor is patient watching that render. Oh, no render bars. Normally, right. when we sit back and we teach a group, we pull the group. We pre-polled you, and those of you who filled it out, great. Those of you who missed it, don't worry. It's still probably pretty representative. Some 66% of you, this is your first max. Some 40, 34%, thank you for coming back. For those of you that's the first time, we're going to have a blast. Welcome. Exciting? Exciting so far? OK, energy, it's after lunch. OK? Self-taught, 64% of you say you're mostly self-taught. Your main job, only about 33% of you said video is your primary job. The rest of you are doing it on top of other things. One more item I want to talk about here. Wow, that's so not triggering. Uh, I asked you to rate yourselves, and just so you have a feeling, the bulk of you rate yourself as a two or a three out of five. So let's talk about what not a power tip is, but it's one we want to make sure you know. The accent grove, the tilde key. You can command tab over to or H hide. No, I have to H. Just H hide. H hide? H, yep. Yeah. And there's Premiere. Let's come off a of full screen. The tilde key, the accent grove takes any item and makes it full screen. Ah, uh, but why don't you load a sequence as well? Yeah, let's go ahead. We'll work with the sequence. We'll load our sequence. So we're going to bring a sequence up here just so you can see this. And this is not a tip, although every person in this room should know it. The accent Actually, grove button. I have button. a free tip. You know a free extra tip. Don't have stuff typed into the search this field. This is the free extra tip. If you have anything typed in your search box, they can't you hear you still. You, you have lost everything. You can, they can hear me now? No. No. A little bit. OK. So we'll keep cranking it up. And Carlos, you, where are you, man? Like give him okay. some heat. Yeah, I, give me some heat. OK. So I went to look for my sequence. Nothing was there. That's because the word tips had been typed in, and nothing is there. So just for your record, if I go ahead, if you don't find things, Hit the X key. This happens to me all the time, and I have been using this application almost since birth. Okay? I am only eight years old. Hold on a second, Abba. Can you guys hear him well? No, can we, can we have a little bit more for him? Abba, go ahead and speak, and hopefully they'll get hopefully you. Hopefully I can speak and they can hear me. I really am speaking. Or maybe it's, this is one of those dreams where more? you're dressed in front of a lot of people, more? but you have no volume. Okay. Okay. This is now better. you can sit back and do the tilde. Now I can show you. Thank you, voice of speakers. So, what is not a tip? This is not a tip. If I hover my mouse over any one of my windows and I hit the tilde key, that's in the upper left-hand corner, it will make whatever area I am over full screen. Okay? So, if I want to see my timeline, Full screen, all I'm doing is hovering the mouse and making it full screen. This is great if I have a small laptop, 13 inch, 15 inch, or not a second screen. And the reason I say this is not a tip is how many people knew this? I see 50% of the hands. About okay? 30%. What? About 30%. 30%. I Show can't them count a tip. Either. So, what is a tip? Here is what we would consider a tip going a little deeper. 
I want to go full screen to show my client playback. So instead of hitting tilde, I hit control tilde, and that brings it full screen without anything obscuring the image. I have full screen playback. How many people knew that? Okay. How many people didn't know that? There we go. If you didn't know it, applaud. That tells me how many people where you are. That's the idea of today. Little tricks. We're going to give you different level stuff. We know for a fact some of you have been only using Premiere for a very short period of time, and you just need to absorb as much as possible, but you will get oversaturated. And others of you have been using it for years, and we want to make sure you walk away with a couple of tricks. So you'll have the deck at the end. Absorb what you can. If you know the easy stuff, we promise to give you hard stuff. If you don't get the hard stuff, don't worry. Come back next year. You'll love Max. No, you'll have the deck. And with that, I'm going to pass it back to Jeff. So the next tip I'm going to show you, and I dug deep for this, is move playhead to cursor. It's not mapped by default in the software. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to bring up my keyboard. Now, I use the keyboard command to bring up my keyboard. I'm not going to teach you that. I think you can learn that. The key we're looking for here happens to be move playhead to cursor. And so what I'm going to do is I'm just going to search for that move playhead to cursor. I'm going to click in here, and I'm going to use the number one key. I'm not doing any multi-camera here today. I don't care if I lose the multi-camera key. I'm going to say OK. And now what happens, tilde, full screen, is all I have to do is tap the number one key, and it moves my playhead there. And where this is huge is you've zoomed in on the screen, and you realize you need to be right here. Yeah, you could click here, but your mouse is down here. All you have to do is type the number one, and the mouse jump, jumps to where your cursor is. How's that? OK, let's stop playing. <laughs> Here under timeline settings is a choice called page scroll. That's the default. I'd like you to see we have a choice here called smooth scroll that you've never used. And I'm going to say OK, and I'm going to hit play. Look at my timeline. Nothing. They were too busy we, watching it scroll. We, it's called smooth scroll. It's in your timeline settings. And we need that feedback. If something really makes you cry, you got to let us know. Now, if by some bizarre chance we got to the bottom of this teach and you don't have a win, you come see us after. When this is done, we're going to hang out until you guys are done. If you don't have a win, we will make sure we find one for you. OK, that's fine. Yeah, well, they were. I want to show you one other crazy, crazy trick here. And I'm doing it by expanding. I hit the tilde for the project file. Typically, when I work on a, a, a project, I have a set of rules I use. For example, I always want to name things a certain way. And I have client communications. And what you end up having is a spreadsheet or a, a document that you have to save and store with it. What very few people know is Premiere can actually have text files in the project. Here I have a text file. And I'm going to take this text file, and I'm going to drag it into Premiere. And look at that right there, notes for the project. And if I double click it, it launches my text editing application, and I can have all those notes. For example, music tracks from killer tracks, five photos from Adobe Stock, et cetera. Can that make your lives a little bit better, a little bit easier? Sure. Uh, and that takes us to, there's the smooth scroll. You'll see each slide has the information, making it easy for you to find. And uh, that's going to take us to a little bit about audio. You want to drive and I'll talk? I'll drive. OK. So. Audio meters. Let's go ahead. We'll look at the screen. We all know the audio meters. They're by default in the uh, lower right corner of the interface. And when you play the meters, take a look at what you see. Nice and green stuff. If we go to the back half, Jeff, I know the piano gets really loud. 
I want to do one thing, Abba. I want to make sure our audio is going out. It's going out to the right spot. Okay. okay. Oh, it's not going out the right spot from Premiere. Give me one moment. Pay no attention to the man where, everybody? Behind the curtain. And actually, this is a mixed sequence, so we don't uh, bleed. So you might want to make it a little louder. There we so go. So long as I can continue dancing and teaching and doing So we have the meters. You notice green. We have good. When it gets a little louder, it'll go yellow. Nice gradient. When it gets really loud, it will go red. These have been mixed. That's why it's not going up into the red. Okay, you want to... too loud. And I'm trying to... just hit G and bring it up. We're going to make it a little louder because I want you to see what happens here. You act and behave as much like a dancer as I could. Challenge of mixed so audio. One of my first Okay, you see it goes to a nice gradient. Taking my and first then five. probably you know it goes to a gradient when it's red. That looks really pretty. You just made this full screen with tilde. Okay? But that's and not useful to me. Okay? I want to know where my audio is in that yellow zone. Okay? Because in that yellow zone, is about where I want my voice levels to be, the dB levels. But the gradients don't help me. So we're going to change that. We're going to fix that. We're going to turn that off. So what we want you to do is back in game. the application. We're doing this full screen so you I can see it. it. Jeff is going to right click. And do you know there's some drop downs here? We're going to make some changes. The first change that we're going to make, and this go down, I lost you, Jeff, there, is instead of having the gradients, we're going to uncheck that show color gradients. Now when we play that back, I can see exactly that when she's talking, so if I solo her voice, I know that her audio levels are spot on. And to solo something, you can take a look. On the left side of the screen, there's a little S next to your audio. Now it's only going to play that track, okay? And here's the trick, and here's something that's very important. When we are editing, and we I try like to put specific audio on sound, specific so tracks all of her sound. voice on camera and, uh, is on track one all of the sound on tape is track two to all of the music is on three when you're playing they might so not be able to hear me she's talking so the great thing about this is i can select a whole track bring volume up and down while looking at those meters but that still is not quite enough for me it still is not giving me enough feedback information let's go back to the meters and make a couple more changes Okay, so now he's taking. So, we're going to make two other changes here to these meters. Change number two is we're going to take it off of dynamic peaks. Premiere, while it's playing back, is bouncing a line. We want to see that line stay constant at the top. And we also want to see show valleys, show the bottom. So, Abba, would you go and give us show valleys and static peaks? No, I guess not. Sorry. Static peaks, show valleys. I'm going to come back here. I'm going to hit play where her voice is. So, I'm a dancer from Crimea. And now you can and see my first clearly lesson, how she's speaking I remember and the range she's in America, speaking in. At Maryland Youth Valley, and I was eight years old. So as and long as we're I doing felt that, like a dancer had to let's talk about one or two other pieces of audio here. Music is dangerous to you as an editor. If you're wearing headphones, you know what's going to happen when you play music. You're going to become shocked because it's mixed to the full decibel range. So what we're going to do here is we're going to take some music up in, and we're going to tell this music, let's see here, there's the music bin. Well, yep, there's the bin. If he clicks on any item, he can hit the letter G for gain, G. And when he does this, it brings up the audio gain box. Now, it's showing you here the peak amplitude at the bottom. That's the loudest moment. And I usually like music down 20 to 30 decibels. We could just say adjust this for minus 20. Go ahead and do that, Abba. And you can see it say OK. But it's not enough to do that on a single clip. I'd like you to know we can do this on an entire bin. So, Abba, close up the bin. If he goes to the music bin here and types the letter G, we get that same window. Notice it's got a just gain by. That's what, on top of whatever adjustments are made. We don't want that. We want the top choice. Adjust set gain, because all the music is at zero, almost at the top. 
We can add more music to this bin, click on the bin, hit the letter G, say minus 20. Every piece of music has been dropped 20 decibels. You never need to have your ears blown off as a musician. You drop a new, the question is, what happens to the new piece of music? It's loud, but if you hit the letter G, that top choice, you can just repeat it over and over again and not deafen anybody. Okay, which brings us to the next idea here. And while we're bringing the next idea, I'm gonna just give you a preference thing, we'll throw it in. This is annoying as heck to me. Whenever I double click on any of the, my folders, it launches this as this annoying floating window that I have to move around. 99% of the time, I do not want this floating window, okay? So what I want you to do, or what I'm going to do, and I want you to do it when you get home, is you're going to go down and you're going to go to your preferences, okay? And in your preferences, under general, and we're going to zoom in here, I'm going to show you exactly where this happens. When I double click, I don't want it to open in a new window. I want to open it in a new tab so I can have a couple of tabs open. Now, the second one, when I hold down the command key or the control key on a Windows machine, open in place, that's great. That still works for me. And I don't want to lose the ability to open a floating window. There are times I want to do it, so that will be my option key. So I'm just flipping it back and forth to open in a new window. I'm going to kick on OK. So now, while we're doing this demonstration, now while we're editing, when I double click on any of these bins, it opens it up as a new tab. I can very easily jump back and forth between my tabs, and it's a lot less of a pain in the neck. How was that? Great. So coming back to the deck here a moment, I'd like to ask the question here about how many of you, oh, we added that. This one was you. You talk. OK, so this is another thing with meters. Um, sometimes when I'm finishing, I find that I want my meters to be even bigger, not full screen, not tilde. You can rearrange all of the panels in Premiere, and a lot of you are aware of that. But what I like to do <coughs> is I like to move my meters right along my sequence so that I can really see those levels in detail as I'm watching my show. My eyes don't have to move. And it's pretty simple to do. If you hit the right spot, you'll... It is, it is one of the few spots where it's actually a little difficult. There it goes. In the center, that'll become a tab. Up here, it'll be that region of the window. We'll rebalance the windows. And I'll Pretty be sweet. worried that I'll be too Now you can really loud. see those meters. And, and then I'll ask, along those lines, we'll skip that one. Uh, how many people hate this? Yeah, well, if you buy one of these little USB audio interfaces, you can plug your speakers into it, you can plug your headset into it, and unplugging and plugging will make no difference whatsoever. This one's a Behringer, there's a number of them on the market, this cost me like $35, and now everything stays plugged in, and I never have to deal with that stupid window for the rest of my life. And that brings us to a concept called no memorization. You want to drive for this? Absolutely. So, yeah, here I come out here. I want to talk to you. I don't believe you should memorize software, ever. You all know, Macintosh users, the command to save. It's Command S. You're smarter than you know. Something that can help you be faster and make mistakes faster is to learn a language of how to talk to software. So, let's see the next slide. What's the key for an out point? Now, Abba, go ahead, hit the button. This is the part where you say, oh. Okay. Oh. Now watch this. What's the key for you to shift to an out point? Next slide. Shift O. It's that obvious. Shift I to shift to an out to an in point. When we ask a question, we're not trying to trick you over the next 75 minutes. I'm not, I'm not a fan of teachers who try and trick you with stuff. Does anybody, Macintosh users for this one, does anybody know the optional way to clear an out point? The optional. 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 To way to clear an out point? What is it? Optional. Beautiful. My last name's Greenberg. Green is always the right answer. 
Let's uh, go to the next slide. There we go. Um, Windows users, you should just be aware that the key is Control, Shift, I, and O. And I hate that. It feels very non-intuitive. It should be Alt, I, Alt, O. And so what I do in my Windows systems, because I don't care. I want people to hire me as an editor. I'm not that choosy that I want to turn down somebody who goes cut on windows. I'm happy to take their money for whatever they want me to cut on. I turn off in windows all the error sounds. I don't care if it makes an error sound. I just don't want to be bothered by it. And if you're on a windows system, you're tired of those sounds anyway. Let's go to our next slide here. Let's use a natural language mnemonics in a practical way. So. This is the order of work, right, everybody? You import stuff in number one, you look at it on number two, you work on it in number three, and you watch it on number four. OK, I just taught you four keys. Watch this. Mr. Shapiro. So if I want to go to the first window, I need to find my project window. If he wants to shift to the first window, what's he going to press? OK, what do you think I'm going to press when I want to shift to the second window? Third? And? Now, I want to talk about shift three, and I want to talk about shift two. The reason I really love shift three is, have you ever clicked in the timeline and moved the playhead accidentally? Those days are over. Shift three. I used to think shift two was silly, was useless. Abba, would you throw a couple clips, some, maybe some of the B-roll into, into Absolutely. Uh, As a matter of fact, I'm going to throw all of these clips that I had that I'm going to use for B-roll and just drop that onto my second window. What's the key to go shift to the second window? Abba, shift two a couple times for us. Let me it's revolving between those clips. You could take somebody's performance. You could take a take and load all the takes up into that window. Watch a take, shift two. Watch the next one. Yeah, shift so there's two. all the clips I just it's dropped in. I can toggle between them. Shift two. Get to the clip I want, mark in and out, bring it to the timeline. There's another clip I want to use. I know it's there. Shift two. I don't have to keep going down into the project and click on it. Could you show them the drop down list for us, please? I did. We want you to see there's a list there, and you're able to clear all the items in that list if you want to. Um, let's open up one more keyboard, and then we'll move uh, into our media browser. I, I like this tip while Jeff's opening it up. He doesn't think it's exciting. You guys get to vote. We learn tilde. Tilde will make wherever your mouse is active, right? Full screen. We knew that. We also learned shift one, two, three, and four activates my windows. Did you know that shift tilde will open up any of the windows? Whatever the highlighted. That are highlighted. So if I go, so what I do is I go shift three to highlight my timeline. Then all I have to do is hit shift tilde, goes full screen. Oh, I want it to be my project window. I can hit shift one, make that the live window. Tilde, that's now full screen. Don't need to move my mouse over anything. I can just very quickly get exactly where I want to be. Good or no good? I get a half good. You get a half good. Let's uh, just briefly cover, uh, just so you can see all these things, just as a quick refresher. That's that order of work. There's that shift one. There's that shift two between different clips. There's that shift three, which can be between different timelines. So you can have three or four timelines open if you want to and shift three between them. Shift four, totally useless. It's the same as shift three. But what comes after, what comes after the number th four, people? Uh, but would you hit a shift five for us? It's your effect controls. How many, there you go. You want to get to your effects control? Boom. But deselect yeah. all, deselect all the clips so they can see something up in there. Just click on the timeline, one of the clips, please. There we go. Shift five. There we go. That's what I was looking for. That's just, oh, by the way, what comes after five? We're going to skip six. 
Lucky number seven. Shift seven. So I'm always wanting to throw an effect on there. Where the heck is my effects window? I don't know. It's moved around. It's hiding. Shift seven. I get my effects library, and now I can very quickly type in whatever effect I want. This is just a way faster way to work. And the whole concept is, throughout Premiere, there are keys that are really obvious. I want to just throw one in and let's go to the media browser. Sounds like a plan. Um, I'm going to do zoom in hand. OK. And then you can do the media browser. Uh, it, hopefully, you know plus and minus to zoom in and out on the timeline. So, so I'm hitting just the timeline selected. I hit the plus and minus key. If you're on a full keyboard, these are the keys with next to the numbers uh, above the I, O, and P, plus and minus. Zooms me in, zooms me out. And underneath the backspace key is a slash to let you see everything. But I find that users, Premier users, really don't tend to use the zoom tool. And if he grabs the zoom tool, Z, all he's got to do is lasso horizontally, not vertically, around what he wants to focus on. And when he lets go, it zooms right to this perfect spot he wants to be. Now, Abba, would you type the number one, which would move your playhead there? And now his playhead is ready to go. This is from what we just did at the very beginning of this class. And if he hits the letter H for hand, he can go ahead and grab the entire timeline and move it left and move it right based on his needs. I'm not saying you're bad editors because you don't know these things. It's if you're a bad editor if you don't get paid. You're a bad editor if you work for free and there's no equivocation along. I cannot work for exposure. I cannot feed my children on exposure. So any way that you deliver for a client and they're happy, we're happy. I just would like you to be more intuitive with the way these tools work. I think we need to get back to the ready position. Oh, that's right. Uh, any time that you pick any of these tools, you need to return to the Photoshop arrow. It happens to be the shape of an arrow. It's the letter V. So anytime you pick any of these tools, you hit the letter V out of habit to get you back to the arrow, because Premiere's behavior changes when it doesn't have the arrow selected. Next item, sir, I believe is the media browser. I will let you do that. OK. So first, how you guys doing? Good. Have you had a couple wins? Is anybody crying yet? OK, the really? onions are going to be passed around soon. Just slice them. So I'd like to show you that file menu import is not the way to bring in your media. This is a nice box. You can drag and drop from your OS, but I'd like you to see there's a tab here called the media browser, and I'm going to go full screen. And what it allows me to do is it allows me to look at my media. Let's, uh, nope, nope, not there, here, desktop. Adobe IBC, maybe. No. I should pick a better folder for this. Let's do desktop one more time. Max uh, resources. You'll never need, should use Command I to import again. It's always going to the media browser tab. Clips. So this lets me see those clips and preview them before they come in. And some of you may be aware of that. But what I'd like you to see here underneath this panel menu is this choice right here a new media browser panel. And when I choose this, I now have two media browsers. And I can set this one somewhere specific. And you'll see I have a favorite set. I should have set a favorite on this project here. Let's see, we want to be on uh, R. There's this class. Here's the medium projects. Here is the color correction clips. So now I have two media browsers here one in this location, one in this location, and you can take one of these and put it in a place where you need to travel all the time. Maybe your music folder, maybe your graphics. And instead of you having to sit back and navigate four or five times, you can have multiple media browsers, which is huge on a, a two screen or a large screen system. And I'll also point out that you can take any one of these folders and you can right click and you can say add to favorites. And when you do so, you don't have to search for it. You can just click and be right in that folder ready to go. 
This is the yeah. media browser. This is favorites, your everyday directories. This is multiple browsers, two browsers visible for you. Uh, and that's the media browser. I'd like you to import smarter, import visually. How'd I do? There's something else you learned just then is that look underneath those little three slices of the paper or the hamburger, however you want to call it. They're all over the interface. You will discover things that you can do with the application. Do the undo, do the undo, uh, do the undo one, the undo panel, the history panel. Oh, okay. So uh, that, that's really uh, a, a very useful thing. As a matter of fact, here's an example that Jeff suggested. You're going to drive for this? Yep. So first of all, how many people know that you can undo in Premiere? I hope that's 100%. Okay, Control Z, Command Z, Control Z, Command Z. I'll let all the US and the Canadians and the Australians all fight about that key. But what's important is, in addition to undo, you have something called a history panel. How many people knew about the history panel? How many undos do you have in the history panel? All of them. All of them? 32. 32. If you've but, only done 31 edits, yes, you have all of them. OK? But, but guess what? It doesn't have to be 32. There is a little drop-down menu next to history. Take a look at that at the bottom. Settings. Click on settings. Look at that. How many? I can do up to 99 undos in my history panel. 32 is just the default. I have a lot more RAM than I did five years ago. I can go to 99. I can step back in case there was a mistake. So the message here is partially about the history panel, but it's partially that you should explore the software. 10, 15 minutes a day. There's a saying, even an elephant can be eaten one bite at a time. If you spend 15 minutes just playing in the tools you use, you'll find all sorts of joy. Now I'd like to take us to something that is not a space of joy. And it's this. How many of you have ever opened a project in the wrong version of Premiere, hit save, worked for a day, and then kind of been a little upset because you realized you needed to be in a little bit older version of Premiere? Can I hear anybody who's had that pain? Let's fix that. This, of course, is unsanctioned by Adobe. So you'll never see us again in about three minutes. The hard way to do this is to follow all these things, to rename the project, to unzip the project, to, to change some stuff in it. But this guy, Brad Clutere, has on the internet a Premier Pro project downgrader. You take your project, you upload it to him, he gives it to you back, and when he gives it to you back, it'll open up in other versions of Premiere. It may not be as stable, it may not be super safe, but if you need to do that Hail Mary pass, because you're your editor who somewhere is on a different version of Premiere and you've been working at home, this is your solution. What do you think? I'm going to skip the other one for... Uh... Yeah, Michelle is here. Yeah, I know. Uh, okay, so let's uh, jump to some little things that are fun. We did the undos. Uh, this one's a personal one, dragging clips to a folder. I find that when I'm working in a project, shift one. When I'm working in a project, tilde key. That if I want these to be in a folder, I kind of find myself making a folder or right click creating a bin, and it's not in the place I really want it to be. If I grab these clips, let's grab some for say. First of all, how many people do it that way? You make a bin, you're hunting around, yeah? We can't hear when it's only one hand. You have to put two of them together. Just make sure that we know that you're learning something. Because if you're not learning something, we're going to work even harder. So I've got these selected here. I'm going to go ahead, and I'm just going to drag them to the icon of a folder, and it puts them in the folder right in a place, correct, collecting them all in one switch. Makes my life a lot easier than creating bins and sorting manually. I just think that's a little one that's fun. Save you some time. I think it's a lot better than you think it is. I, and I, you invented it. I know. I no, didn't you invent. found out about it. This one's you. OK. Well, you want to drive? Sure. Talk? So you're editing. And let's switch over to uh, Premiere. And I want to select a clip where my playhead is parked, OK? I don't want to use my mouse because I'm using my mouse for other things. It's holding my coffee from falling over. If I want to select the clip, 
where the, mount, where the uh, playhead is parked, I can do something. I can use the D key. I do this all the time. I want to select the clip. I'm playing along. I can hit the D key, and now I can start modifying this clip Answer with the keyboard. Answer from Crimea, and for my first ballet lesson. So this gives me a lot of power when I'm doing things. So that's one of those little tricks. Select D clip. Select D clip. He loves the ways for people to remember things. Now, sadly, you can't select and edit by the default keyboard, but you can set it. And while we're not going to set it today, we suggest that you might choose select nearest edit point as a roll or as a ripple out. These are settable to the keyboard. But the one that I think is a lot of fun, if you want to select an edit, is this. You can hold down the control key on Windows, the command key on the Macintosh, and as you lasso, you're selecting the edits. That's pretty cool. Why is it cool, Jeff? Well, it's cool because I'd like a video only dissolve. Now, on the Macintosh, it's a command for a dissolve, but I'd like to shift that dissolve to being just the video. That's a shift D. And so I've lasted those clips. He's hit shift D and boom. Let me zoom in. Oh, oh, no, no. I was already, yep. No, no. Oh, they all have dissolves on them, all because we were able to quickly lasso them and lasso the edits. You can do this vertically, you can do it horizontally. Yeah, we can grab the clips, but by being able to grab the edits, it gives us a little higher level of refinement. And I do want to step back to the last uh, slide here, and that was this one here. Just in case you didn't hear it, this is in your keyboard preferences. So there are a lot of features and a lot of things you can do that don't have keys mapped to them. Some pretty amazing ones, and this is an example. So if you were wondering where you can find that, you go to the keyboard preferences. You can simply type in select nearest. It's going to isolate that and then assign an appropriate key that you would remember. When Adobe releases an update, I spend a little bit of my life going through and looking for cool things in here. I'll show you one cool thing that's a little bit out of our script. I'm going to go ahead and click this clip. It's up here in the browser. I'd like you to know that Shift Home and Shift End go to the head and tail of a shot up in the effect editor. You don't use up and down because the down arrow goes to the first frame of the next clip. Shift Home and End go to the first and last frame of a clip. It's just like the regular home and end on the timeline. So if I did home and end on the timeline, I'd be going to the beginning and end. When I do it on a clip up here, I'm going to the home, shift uh, three, shift, I'm sorry, five. I'm going to the home and end of the clip up here, meaning I can set keyframes quickly and directly without having to play keyboard tricks. So, uh, yeah? So, remember how we have what's not a tip and what is a tip? Well, what's not a tip is a tip for some of you. What is a tip is hopefully a tip for many of you. I'm going to go ahead and build a quick string out for this. Okay. So, you know, there's lots of ways to uh, trim. You can mark your in and out points in your source monitor. You can mark in and out points in the actual project file where you're browsing your clips. Especially nice if you're an icon view. But I sometimes like to clean up my timeline, just throw things on really fat. And there are two keys that are amazing that I probably use, I probably worn them out on my keyboard. Okay? And that is called tops and tails, or cutting off the heads and the tail. Proper, proper name for it is ripple trim, previous edit the playhead, ripple trim, next edit the playhead. And where should you put your fingers? You should put your fingers on the Q and the W key. Q and W, and I tend to imagine it that my fingers are on either side of the playhead. And now, Abba? Now, if I hit, let's go bring the playhead towards the head of the clip. The, okay, so if I hit Q right now, it's going to trim off everything to the left of that playhead to where the actual edit point is. Okay, how many people would go position their playhead, maybe switch to the cut tool, the C key, cut it, select it, delete it, select the space, right click, ripple delete, and you're done, right? No more. That's Q. not the tip. There's That's too not many the people tip. who That's... know about Q and W okay. at this point. And, and W, pretty tricky to figure out, 
it will trim off everything to the right of where the playhead is parked. So Q&W, imagine it over your playhead. The problem is, is a sequence like this. If you hit the W key right now, it'll trim something, but boy, it'll do all sorts of... In fact, it didn't do anything right there. Well, it's not again. doing anything. I goes. love this when I have an, uh, an audio track of a voiceover, or if I, with, that I need to trim down, I just put the whole thing in. I can see my waveforms. I can sit there, hit Q. I can hit W. Here's, and here's a W. And you can see it's doing a cut, but it's cutting our music. It's doing all sorts of things we don't want. So it's time for us to see a variation on it. And that variation is the Alt key. Alt Q and W lifts that information. So here I am above this shot. Let's say right here. Now I'm going to hit Shift, Q, uh, sorry, Alt Q just so you can see it. You can see it lifted all of those. I don't want that. I'm going to undo that. I'm going to shift click my audio track, shift click my video track. What did that just do, Jeff? Turned off the lights telling Q and W where to work. And because you hit shift, it turned them all off. You don't have to click on each one. Hold down the shift key, click on one. Hold down the shift key, click on it again. So with that selected, I can still use now shift Q, undo, or shift W. Whoops, not shift, Alt Q, undo, Alt W to get rid of one side or the other without damaging the entire timeline. And there's one last variation of this, Mr. Shapiro. So uh, I, I, sometimes I think we, we were really fast. I want to clarify that. So the whole idea is it's doing the trim, but it's not rippling it to throw off everything in your timeline. That's what he did with the Alt. But there's another thing you can do. You can get a little shifty about things, OK? There is the, it gets worse, people. The puns get worse. Uh, you can use Shift Q and W, which does something completely different. Jeff, go ahead. It's a roll edit. A roll edit allows you to select both sides of a trim here and move this, these both sides left or right. And you can click and drag with it. By the way, the tool for that, it happens to be the end tool. I don't have a really good keyboard mnemonic for it. To me, it looks like a stitch the end, and it allows me to grab and edit and move it left and right. But the beautiful part about Shift Q or Shift W, Shift Q, Shift W, move that over, is it rolls it to the playhead without me having to switch tools, paying attention to whatever tracks are hot. And we've been talking about Shift here. Well, there, there we go, there's Shift Q, Shift W. It's time to drop the S-bomb. Wait, wait, it's Michelle here. Okay, we promised we wouldn't do it, but it's okay. We're gonna drop the S-bomb. It's important to explain this. And Jeff, go ahead. It's the shift key. Shift key. The shift key is the best key in Premiere you don't know to use. You saw it used the shift on and off those tracks, right? Let's see a couple uses of the shift key here. Look at all that. Here are all of them. Remember, you're going to get this deck. So you'll have all these keyboard shortcuts. So one of my favorites, absolute favorites, full screen here on this timeline, slash key. When I have all my tracks on, shift click, the up and down arrow stops at every edit. Everybody see that? So how many people use the up and down arrow to jump to edits? Yeah, it's useful. How many people get frustrated when it doesn't stop at the edit you want? Okay. Well, I now have only V3 on. Shift click, click V3. I'm going to use my up and down with the shift key. Shift up, shift down, stops at every edit regardless of the track lights. Yes! Thank you for crying. We're not going to go through each and every one. We want you to know we've documented these for you, that you can change track heights with the shift key. Well, I think we should tell them about shift plus and minus. OK. So a lot of times you're, you're working, and I'm going to go ahead and switch back to the application. It's always tricky getting away from PowerPoint. So I'm working here. I'm going to bring this back to my working heights. And it's like, OK, this is great. This is the height of my track. But sometimes I want to see more detail or I want to see less, and I don't want to manually do stuff. 
So shift is going to help me. If I hit the shift key and the same plus and minus keys that I was using to zoom in and zoom out earlier in the timeline, shift minus will collapse all of my tracks so that I can very easily see things. And if I have a lot of tracks, it's great. Shift plus will expand all my tracks to a defined size and it's very easy to see everything. And of course, tilde if I want to see everything full screen. I want to do two variations before we move on because we're going to go a little dry in a moment. I'd like you to know, by the way, that plus and minus, the control key does all of the uh, audio, the command key does all of the video tracks on the Macintosh. Let command me, uh, plus and here. minus. Command plus and minus does, is it not? No, you're tricking me. Command plus oh. and minus and oh, oh, silly me. I worked all day yesterday on a Windows machine. Yeah. And I'm like mnemonically challenged. Command plus and minus does uh. the video tracks. Alt plus and minus does the audio tracks. And I want to just throw one in for a bonus. If you get these that you're really happy with the way they are, do you see the wrench up there in the timeline? Under the wrench is a choice there called save preset and it will snapshot that timeline for you so you don't have to get all the heights in weird ways. We have one here already pre-saved called teaching track heights and when he chooses it, it'll all go at a visible size. Go ahead, choose it. When he comes off tilde that we can see all the tracks really well on the timeline for teaching. So you can build these sort of presets to make your life easier. Let's go to the deck and deal with some pain stuff. Okay, let me just do one thing to clean house. Sure. So we targeted some tracks differently here, and this happens all the time. Right now, if I bring something in, it's going to go on to V1 because that is the highlighted track, the one in blue. My audio is going to go down here into A3. I need to reset this. I don't want to have to manually move this down. All I need to do is right-click on this, and then there should be, if I right-click on the right area, which is the empty area here, Oh, Jeff, help me here. It's the V or A. Uh, I, I, I am. Go to the left. There go to go. the left. This is where I started. Default source assignments. I love that. Go. This is where I was. Boom. Everything is back to their defaults there. And with the video, default source. Now, why don't I necessarily... Oops. So I did my source. And then I don't have any video here. And some people go, well, what's wrong? What's wrong with my machine? It's because the last clip we loaded in was an audio clip. So your source will be based upon whatever is loaded into your source monitor. Which is, there we go, those are the two things. Okay, let's switch to the deck here. Deck. So I want to talk about a, um, a, one of the things in this class, one of the great pain points in video is how long it takes to export. Is there anybody Who's happy with the amount of time it takes for things to export? Boo. Come on, give me, no, no, give me, give me some boo there. Boo. I'm going to get a little technical. This is slide-based technical. You can reach out to either of us for the rest of your natural born lives. If you become a zombie or a vampire, I don't want to know you. So this is called faster exports. And the first concept is to use your previews. When you use your previews in Premiere, when you render, that's what a preview technically is. When you render, you can say, on export, use previews. And so as you work, you select areas and say render, and you select areas and you say render, except there's a problem. What's the problem, Jeff? The render files themselves, the codecs, are often terrible codecs for render. They're very fast, but they're not the quality I would like. By the way, in the keyboard is my favorite remapping called render selection. Instead of you making an in and out and doing a render, I'm just going to lasso stuff, hit the enter key, because I remap mine to the return key, and it renders whatever I have selected on the timeline. So we've been working and rendering and working and rendering. Our render files aren't in a great format. We have to check the change the render type to a post or mezzanine codec. And for that, just so everybody's aware, what we're doing is called the sequence settings here. I'd like you to see right there, it says sequence settings. Abba, could you show us where the sequence settings are on a project? So it's here under the word sequence. Under the 
sequence um, menu. At the very top is sequence settings. And when he chooses that, right there at the top it says editing mode. And what we want to change it to is custom. And then we're going to change it to quick time. Custom, I believe, is at the very top. Here at the uh, video previews, it's iframe only MPEG. We would change it here to a codec that's more robust. We're not going to go any further than that. We just want to show them where it physically exists. The screenshot has all of that. So, but I, I want to emphasize, yep. we make this change so we can use our previews to get something out quickly. There's an efficiency to the default codecs. So if you're not in a situation where you're doing lots of rendering and you switch to one of the higher end, high quality codecs, you're going to create some big files and you may not need it, that workflow. So this isn't a global decision to say everybody switch to this, but if there are times you know that you're editing and you want to get something out quickly and it's a long show or a long movie, it's a great workflow to have these high end previews and then all you do, you get a phone call or a cup of coffee, you're stepping away from your keyboard for a moment, just hit that return key because select all, hit return, just like Jeff does, and it'll do some nice rendering. You finish that phone call, you tell mom, I gotta get back to work. Two hours later, you say it again, but you now have these high quality renders for a really quick export. I, the group that I always do this with is anybody in news because they're always, always, always under the gun. So, and you should just be aware, the codecs we picked, can we bring back the deck? Yes, sir. The codecs that we picked here, these are what's known as mezzanine high quality codecs. And now when we use previews, we have a high quality source, not a low quality source. So that's step one. By the way, I will tell you, don't use max quality. And I know what your heart is saying, I want my stuff to look the best. That max quality increases your export time because it's using a better mathematics for upscaling video that's smaller. If you're not upscaling, say, tiny files to high def or 4K, throwing the switch gives you no benefit whatsoever and the pain of taking longer. Now, let's do second level of faster exports. There is a feature when you go to export called the smart rendering codec. How many people have said, man, I like it when my stuff is smart? Right. So the thing is, your camera format, your timeline rendering codec, and your output all have to match. If you can make the three of these match, this will work. So. If you get your camera, your render, and your output to all be the same, it becomes a file copy, not a compression. A file copy. Now, there's a trick to this. Uh, it's these codecs here at the bottom that do it. And one of the things that uh, both Abba and I use, we have an Atmos. Did you bring your ninja with you? You know, you, you bring a ninja, and the next thing you know, he's disappeared. No, I did not. There's nothing like a good ninja joke in the midday. So you use an Atmos box and plug it into your camera and you capture ProRes. You render your sequence in ProRes. You output in ProRes. And then you bring it back to Media Encoder and encode it to anything else. And it has to do none of the calculations of the render because it's so blazingly fast. It's basically copying the file. Fast as a copy. I got one last faster export for you. Some systems now have this choice called hardware encoding for H.264 and H.265. And I found out on my computer it was encoding H.265 faster than anything else because of the specific motherboard. The thing I want to tell you is you'll either have access to it or you won't. Generally, generally, hardware-based encoding looks worse than one or two pass software encoding. And what the secret is, is to take the bit rate and make it larger. Sure, it'll take longer to upload, but it's going to be a way faster export, giving you a much happier lifestyle and letting you go home and see your families. Here for family, there we go. Just a little color. Oh, I'll do this. Sure. Give you a chance to rest your voice. OK, so I'm going to jump back here, and then we'll go to the slide. There's some new features we just want to point out. We're going to hide this. And to work with color, the secret is 
which isn't much of a secret, make sure you click on the color workspace. If you are not aware of workspaces on the very top of the interface, they're awesome. You need to know about them. I'm clicking on the color interface. As a matter of fact, we were playing with this earlier, so it may not look like the interface that you're used to seeing. Abba, how do you reset a workspace? I, I, I remove the application, install a new OS, or if I'm in a hurry, I can just double click on that. I'll get a question that says, yes, do I want to switch back to my default? You know, it used to be you had to go to that little flyout, that little panel menu. Now you can just double click any of them. Boom. This is also great if you lose a window. How many times have you like, I don't know where my project window is because you've clicked on it and you've closed that panel. Well, we now know a couple ways to bring this in. Yeah, shift okay. one. Shift one will bring that back. But if you lost a window and you don't know what the shifty key for that is, just go ahead, I'll go back to editing, double click, boom. It brings everything back to the default way. So that is really, really useful, that double clicking. I find that, by the way, most people aren't actively using their workspaces frequently enough. They really make working in that specific part of Premiere smarter and better. The engineers have given you the right tools for the right sort of operations. And they added some stuff to the Lumetri filter in this release of Premiere. We'd like you to see what the key pieces are. So the first thing that you should realize, you don't have to add the Lumetri filter to a clip before working with it. If you notice, in my source panel, I've opened up the effects control, which happens to be Shift-5. And as soon as I touch anything in here, I'm going to just go to the basic correction, pull down my saturation, assuming I can see that. There we go. And as soon as I touch anything, it applies that Lumetri filter to that clip. And that's great, right? Bonus, double click, uh, double click the slider, it resets the slider. And then if I want to add another Lumetri filter, I've done some basic or what we call global corrections. Can I say the old school method? Old school method. Old school method of me adding another Lumetri because I'll do one to fix the picture and then a second one to select a sky or a face. What I would do is I used to go down all the way to the project window, the effects. I found it was just faster to click on the Lumetri, copy, paste it and reset it. And Adobe fixed it with this release. Let me zoom in. Look at that right there add Lumetri color effect, so as well I... as renaming it so you know which each one of them is doing. So I'm going to add an effect. I'm going to this, now if I click on this, which is the one I'm working on, I'll rename that. Second one's going to be called secondaries. So just so you were aware, the language of color correction, primary means working on the entire shot. Secondary means working on a part of the shot. So I'm going to change the name of the first one don't necessarily have to do this, but I like labeling things. I think it works out really well. Rename and we'll call it primary. Did I even type that right? Yeah, you did. It's good Excellent. enough. So there we go. And I can very quickly know which Lumetri color effect I'm working on. Now, speaking of secondaries. Speaking of secondaries, there is something here, don't open it yet, called the HSL Secondaries, and it's got a lot added to it in this version release. Let's go ahead and see it. We're going to go there, uh, go there, go there. Actually, it's Curves. You're right. Close up, close up the HSL Secondary. Yep. Hit Curves. Q Saturation Curves. You're used to RGB, but... I'm going to zoom back here Take a, a look. Yeah, zoom back. I'd like you to see what these say. They say things like hue versus saturation, hue versus hue, and they have an eyedropper. I'd like you to take the word versus out of your vocabulary. There's too much polarization, too many people going us versus them. We're going to use controls. Hue controls saturation. Hue controls hue. So look on this shot. She's got this gorgeous red dress. Somebody goes, 
I'd like the red to be even more intense. So I'd like to pick the color red and increase or decrease the saturation. There is an eyedropper up there. Abba's gonna hit the eyedropper in her dress. It's gonna form three points. Now sadly, one of the points is all the way, the center point is all the way in red. But watch what happens when he grabs it and moves it up and down. It's increasing. Why don't we take the saturation out? I'm seeing nothing. Are you seeing anything? Neither I am, am I. I. Um, improvise, adapt. Oh, because it was doing the one on the bottom track. Oops. Boom. Oops. Here we go. Once again, Abba's got the right one selected, and now he's going to go ahead here and choose that same eyedropper. And when he clicks, he can grab the red knob and pull it up and down. Yeah. There you go. And you Double can click see on that for me. The threshold, getting just the dress, not her skin tone. Double click on it for me to reset it. Go to Hue versus Hue and select her eyedropper, Hue, her dress. Hue versus Hue. Oh, Hue controls Hue. Thank you. I'm going to pick a Hue and I'd like to control what Hue you're seeing. And as he picks it up and down, we can change the color of the dress. How cool is that? These are part of the new color tools here, and I highly recommend you play with these because they're going to work in real time. It's this idea that I'm going to have, usually on a clip, a minimum of two or three lumetries. And because of this, I have robust secondaries uh, here in Premiere to make my life a lot easier. Uh, do we want to do search bins or do we want to uh, jump ahead? We have 11 minutes. We have 11 minutes. We'll okay. So um, I want to do a pet peeve of mine. I want to show you the pet peeve here. Uh, let me switch to our deck. Curves. There's that controls. Thanks, Mitch Jacobson. I want to talk about search bins. This is going to be a little bit boring. It's not. I'm going to talk a little bit about metadata. It's not boring. I mean this in the most emotional way I can talk to you about. It is, I as an editor, as I'm looking at clips, I go, I like this clip, I like that clip. And there's a good choice in Premiere. What I would used to do is I used to take these clips, let's go back to editing, let's go full screen tilde. I used to take clips I liked and I would take it and I'd actually copy and paste it into a bin of favorites. And what would happen is <coughs> they would show up inside the favorites. I would copy and paste it there, copy, paste. But my problem is, is that if I ever wanted to look at this clip, I really liked the ones that were similar to it. I really wanted to see the other dancing B-roll shots as alternate shots, not where my favorites were. And if you've never seen it, it's got, Premiere has the ability to take any clip, right click and say, reveal in project. And the problem is, for this favorite, it would find this one, not where the other clips that I wanted were. So I was playing around one afternoon, and there's this good tab. And I'm gonna say good and click on it. Do you notice I gotta click on it once and click on it a second time? I just would like you to see that there's a neat panel called metadata. I'm going to pull this tall, pull this wide. The metadata panel. I'm going to go ahead here. Let's close that up. Let's uh, make that just a little taller. The cool part about the metadata panel is if you have multiple things selected, it can toggle them on multiple shots. So if I go in here and I say these four clips, five clips, I'd like to be good. When I throw that switch mark, they're all marked good. Now that's pretty cool, they're all marked good. I can certainly search for that. And there's this little search folder, search bin from query. I press this button. What kind of media am I looking for? Well, I wanna find good. What is good? Is it good, is it bad? It happens to be true or false because it's a Boolean. I'm gonna type in the word true I'm gonna say okay, and now I have a bin that's pre-built that automatically finds all shots that I mark are good. So if I go here and I grab another shot and I say, oh, this one's good too, 
it automatically will populate into this bin for me automatically. See it happen? So, no, 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 wait. Damn it, wait. Applause. Wait. Search bins to the rescue. And here's what makes search bins crazy. They're booleans, as I said. Ooh, Rainier, Halloween, boo. Booleans, booleans. Um, but it doesn't just have to be good. What if, what if, Skep hide things. What if I created a search bin for the word interview? What if I created a search bin for the word B-roll? A search bin for music, things that are a WAV or an AIFF? What if I created a search bin for AEP, After Effects projects? JPEGs, waves, okay? I literally can get my project to automatically organize itself. And now that's the magic of metadata. Now you can applaud. And that, no, no, they can applaud in one second <laughs> because I showed this two, three years ago in an event called Adobe Video World, which was got a Premiere Pro section. And I waited a year and nobody shared these. I built 50 or 60 search bins the next year. And I'm going to give you those search bins. Now let me show you how they work. All I need to do, oh, you, I didn't know if you knew where they were. All I need to do. When we're, when we're visiting places, he grabs the wheel too. <laughs> is scary. take the search bin project, dump it into Premiere. I'll import the entire project, I'll hit OK. I'm gonna zoom in here so you can see search bins, shot type, everything that's favorited. Everything that's got an action. I want to show you what actions are here. Let me make that wider. Actions. Actions have I-N-G in their name. Jumping, throwing, running. Every single one of these search bins is pre-built to show you an example of how search bins work. And we're going to give it to you so you can just import it in your project and go. How cool is that? Three minutes? Well, we can't, huh? Three minutes, 75 minutes, right? 75 minutes, yeah. The only so, thing I would show for me, but I think that's such a win. It is such a win. We should do something cool. Uh, which one you want to do that's cool that's left? Oh, I, I did the play around, but. You want to do the play around? I love play around. I love play, play around. I love the play around. You drive for play around and then the. You, you talk, have, I'll drive. By the way, we both talk. you thought metadata was boring, and it turns out it's the greatest thing that you're not using. Abba. Show us the other greatest thing that you're not so, using. Oh, there are some things I like to do when I'm editing. It's I either want to play a range of clips, if play clips from in to out. So let's say I select this range of clips. So that's Alt K. There we go. And if I do that, did I get my range? So excited here, I did not get my range. And you know why? Because this was not active. I'm Anna Russell. I'm my dancer from Crimea. So you want to go for Crimea. the big win, and then I go and ahead and blue with the big win. for my first ballet lesson. There we go. I remember it was in America at Maryland Youth Ballet. And I it's my alt key. Option. Jeff, save me. Where'd you go? I'm right behind you. I don't know what you're looking for. I'll, I'll play around current. Play around current. current. Play around current. No, play around current. Shift K. There I'm we go. Anna okay. Russell. So. If you've got a clip selected and you go, I'm I kind of would have liked to I'm see what it was a little bit before it and a little bit after it, shift K. JKL plays, shift K plays around it. So all he's got to do is select any clip or an edit. Let's do a, an edit first. So select that edit point. There you go. I'm it started Russell. behind. It's going to play right I'm through I'm that clip. I use this a lot. I put a transition on something. I want to see how it works. You don't have to back up the playhead. I want to see how it works. I want to do a little bit of a trim on an edit, okay? We didn't even talk about trimming. We talk about that in other classes. But let's say I bring that and I want to just see how it plays. I can go Shift K, plays around. I can see what the edit point is. Actually, we can go into a lot more detail if we had another 75 minutes, which we do not. We do not have another 75 minutes. But we want to give them the slides. Um, I'm going to say this again. If you didn't have a win moment in here, or two, or three, or four, when we're done, we're going nowhere. I'll sit back out here and be here till 9 o'clock tonight Except that to, fi to find a win. 
<laughs> you can't because you got a class after this. A class on advanced editing, I believe? Yes, it's an advanced editing class. Why don't you put this up so they know where they can come get that really cool project file as two, well as two our things. Please, PDF. please fill out your surveys. You're welcome to do any Q&A with us afterwards. That's in the app. And I'd like you to see all the notes. You have to sign up at Bitly Greenberg Updates. I am Jeff at J Greenberg Consulting. That is Abba. That he's Max 18 this year at Shapiro Video. We totally can consult and help and educate your groups. We're both master trainers. Thank you very much. Appreciate your time.